Welcome all. Thank you so much for joining us and welcome to this special event in collaboration with Microbiome Labs and Fullscript Emerson Ecologics. I'm Amy Regan from Emerson Ecologics and I'm so glad you joined us today. A few housekeeping notes. Please place all questions you have in the Q&A box for the question and answer session at the end of the presentation. This webinar is being recorded and will, in the recording will be sent via email to all attendees and registrants. And there is a copy of the presentation slides in the handout section for you to reference during the presentation. It is my pleasure to introduce Star Edwards. Star Edwards is a registered dietitian certified in integrative and functional medicine nutrition therapy with extensive experience in patient and provider education, staff training, and content development. She initially grew interested in functional medicine while searching for the root causes and treatments for her autoimmune condition and her son's eosinophilic esophagitis, a chronic inflammatory condition of the esophagus linked to environmental and food allergies. Her experience in the kitchen and as an RD helped her recreate her family's pantry and meals to accommodate their new diet free of gluten, wheat, eggs, dairy, nuts, soy, and fish. Whew. Star has helped her own clients in her private diet, uh, excuse me, dietetic practice, resolve and manage conditions, including celiac disease, food sensitivities and allergies, diabetes, eating disorders, and more. She has married her experience as a WIC high-risk dietitian for the prenatal and pediatric population with functional medicine, and more specifically, the microbiome as a learning and development manager at Microbiome Labs. She currently educates, trains, and provides clinical support with Microbiome Labs to providers with a heavy focus on bio-FX functional microbiome analysis. She is passionate about supporting her family's health through functional medicine and teaching others to do the same. And without further ado, welcome, Star. Thank you, Amy. And good job with the pronunciation of eosinophilic. <laughs> it's certainly not easy. Some of you know about EOE, and I just say, I'll just say EOE. But I get to say lots of fun words today, too. So we're learning together. I'm very grateful to be here today to talk about a topic that is very important personally to me as a mom raising two boys in an imperfect world. And really, it's a topic that I know has created a lot of anxiety in parents and grandparents and healthcare providers around me. And it's certainly a topic that I get a lot of questions about. So today, I'm going to talk about how an ideal microbiome is shaped even before birth. Some of the things in our modern day world that interrupt the formation of a healthy microbiome, especially during critical development windows, and most importantly, what we can do to overcome these assaults and get the microbiome and health back on the right track. Let's first talk about what the ideal microbiome looks like. The healthy microbiome is both resilient and productive. It's going to be rich in diversity. And, and this photograph on the left-hand side is a picture of a healthy gut. And on the right-hand side is the leaky gut. So you see that the healthy gut has lots of diversity. It has a low level of pathogens. We do take into consideration that it's normal and healthy at times to have some pathogens as long as they're at a low level. It also has a strong mucosal barrier and tight junctions and low mucosal inflammation. Resilience is the property of an ecosystem to resist changes under stress or to quickly and fully recover from insults, and it can be used as a marker of a healthy ecosystem. One marker of resiliency is the natural antimicrobial genes that microbes produce against each other. Having some of these creates a more resilient microbiome. Strong stressors may critically modify the microbiome and impact health but a resilient microbiome will return to its original state of equilibrium after being subjected to insults, whereas a non-resilient microbiome will shift to an altered new state. The adult gut microbiome is fairly stable while constantly being influenced by the host and multiple external factors, some of which we'll talk about today. Triggered by particularly strong stressors, the gut microbiome may be critically modified and this could impact individual health. Once established, the microbiome itself is very resilient and it's not easily changed. In fact, about 60% 
of the bacteria making up the microbiome should remain stable over the course of a five-year period in adults. Keep in mind that a microbiome with low resiliency can place a patient at an increased risk of antibiotic-resistant infections. So the ideal microbiome should remain stable and quickly bounce back from insults. Now let's talk about productivity. Here we see an example of good alpha and beta diversity from our BiomeFX functional microbiome analysis. This matters because a more diverse microbiome is a more productive microbiome, as seen in the photo or the snapshot on the right, which measures a few of the species that produce short-chain fatty acids. Alpha diversity is going to tell you how many different species are in the gut, but beta diversity is going to give you more insight into who is in the gut. Different bacteria have different functions, just like different vitamins and different nutrients from our food, and they contribute to productivity differently. So who is in the gut really does matter. When it compared to adults, young children naturally have high beta diversity. So the species are different than the species we find in adults, but they have low alpha diversity. So not as many different species. So they have fewer species who are different than those found in an adult. And these species are taking up more real estate in the microbiome. In addition to being diverse, a productive microbiome also produces short-chain fatty acids, neurotransmitters. It helps regulate hormones and optimize pH, produces natural antimicrobials, produces enzymes and vitamins, and helps to regulate systemic inflammation and the immune system. And it has this nice crosstalk between the brain, the liver, the skin, lung, and vaginal microbiomes as well. On the other hand, a dysbiotic or unhealthy microbiome is going to be less diverse. There will be reduced keystone species. Those are very important commensal or good bacteria, elevated pathogens, and elevated gram-negative species, which are very inflammatory. As a result, they're going to have sh less short-chain fatty acid production and more hydrogen sulfide, methane, phenol, polyamine, amine, amine, ammonia, and TMAO production. So things that tend to be a little bit more inflammatory and in high levels aren't so good for our overall health. There will also be increased estrogen recycling, which can lead to estrogen dominance, and an increased production of toxins from pathogens and gram-negative bacteria like lipopolysaccharide and virulence factors. Now, the first two years of life represent a critical development window for establishing the microbiome. And during this period, the microbiome is helping to shape the immune system the nervous system and growth. They have found that changes to the microbiome during infancy are associated with the development of chronic illnesses such as asthma and IBD. And certain bacteria are required for parts of the immune system to develop. Bacteroides fragilis, for example, is often seen as a pathogen, but at, during this time, this critical time window, it is associated with B cell maturation and the infant gut, infant gut. These are B lymphocytes. They create antibodies that bind to pathogens and toxins to neutralize them. During this time, the microbiome also provides protection against pathogens. It affects vaccine responses, which we'll be touching on today, and it alters drug metabolism. Now, within those first two years of life, there are a few more key critical development windows of the microbiome. During utero and birth, the microbiome is seeded with a starter culture, if you will, from amniotic fluid, the birth canal, and then breast milk and formula, the skin of those who touch the infant, and even the hospital environment. Some of these microbes quickly begin to dissipate while others take hold and flourish. So during the first few months of life, the microbiome is shifting quite a bit. If a healthy microbiome is established during this critical window, it decreases the risk of allergic diseases, and it helps to set the foundation for long-term health. Another critical window occurs when, with the introduction and expansion of solid food. Food is probably the most important contributor to who is in the microbiome. So as new foods are introduced on top of formula or breast milk, 
diversity begins to change and the microbiome shifts significantly more once again. At two to three years of age, the microbiome becomes very similar to the diverse microbiome seen in adults, but this composition is still distinct even into adolescence. So it's still developing through adolescence. It's not at the adult microbiome by two to three, but it's very close. So what happens during these critical development windows that help shape the core adult microbiome? First, there must be an introduction of microbes, and those first few exposures happen during utero and birth. If we are lacking numbers and diversity in the gut, after if we have exposures to factors that diminish bacteria, they need to be intentionally reintroduced through things like foods, supplements, and the environment. Very important is a gut-friendly diet on which these healthy bacteria can thrive. Some microbes are transient and they move on after they have served their time and others naturally die off. So we need a continual exposure and introduction to microbes through interaction with the environment. We also need to be friendly to our microbes and avoid factors that harm them as much as possible. And again, we're going to talk about some of these factors. Lastly, we need to control and avoid pathogenic infections by following food safety procedures, for example. So we can imagine a resilient and productive microbiome, like the photo of this lush jungle, <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> okay, so we have a photo of a lush jungle on the left. <coughs> it has good inputs, lots of sunshine, clean water, fertile soil, a few weeds, and as a result, we're gonna have a healthy ecosystem. In the second photo, we have a barren desert that's overgrown with weeds and soil and really stripped of any nutrition or water. In the microbiome, this might happen when we also have the wrong inputs. So those are things like poor nutrition, antimicrobial stress, or an overgrowth of pathogens. And in the third photo, we have what resembles a leaky gut or dysbiotic gut that is left alone to re recover after encountering significant damage to the healthy ecosystem, perhaps after an illness and antibiotics or a chronic poor diet. We often leave the microbiome alone to recover, but the truth is that it probably won't completely recover if we leave it unattended. We may be left with the leaky gut pictured here as the cracks between the bricks, and then we can see the plants trying to poke through, but not really getting back to that healthy, lush ecosystem we see in the first picture. And the next blow to this dysbiotic leaky gut will create even more damage. So today we're going to talk about some of the things that harm this ecosystem and tools that we have access to that can really help to reestablish a thriving microbiome as opposed to leaving it unattended to cope on its own. Now, damage to the ecosystem can be caused by a number of things, certainly prescription medic medications like antibiotics, natural antimicrobials, pesticides, infections, second and third hand smoke, stress, lack of sleep, and vaginal a cesarean delivery rather than a vaginal delivery. As far as diet and the pediatric population having being formula fed instead of breastfed or eating the standard American diet that's high in sugar and saturated fat or being a picky eater and having low food diversity, especially with fibers. Now, this is something we don't want to talk. We don't talk about a lot, but I want to spend a little bit of time here. So heavy metal exposure from food and water actually harms the microbiome. We usually think about neurotoxicity, but globally, one in three children have high blood levels of lead. It's actually very common in the U.S. with one in 40 children having blood levels that are considered unsafe. Lead paint and occupational hazards are an obvious source of lead, but drinking water and food are significant contributors as well. There are over 6 million leaded water pipes in the United States, and they tested baby foods and found that 95% of baby foods pulled from the shelves tested positive for lead at least at levels 177 times the level approved by the FDA for drinking water. And this actually includes some organic brands. Being organic doesn't mean that it's lead free. We know that lead is a neurotoxin that slowly accumulates and deposits in soft tissue and the bone over time. 
It's linked to many health conditions and symptoms, but it also impacts the microbiome. It contributes to dysbiosis and permeability of the gut barrier, and it significantly affects vitamin E, bile acid, nitrogen metabolism, oxidative stress, and detoxification mechanisms. So heavy metal exposure is common in the pediatric population. It's found in lots of foods, even if they're organic, and it can create dysbiosis and leaky gut. So that's something else that we need to think about when we're thinking about damage to this ecosystem. Now in adults, there's a few other risk factors. I call these dysbiosis risk factors that include excessive alcohol intake, smoking, and intense exercise. Damage to the microbiome by these dysbiosis risk factors has been linked to many conditions, a few of them listed here, including impaired neurocognitive function, diabetes, and celiac disease. But let's talk about asthma and allergies for a moment because there's been quite a bit of research in this area. It appears that the composition of the microbiome in the first few months of life during that first critical window is crucial for prevention of allergic diseases. There was a study by the Canadian Healthy Infant Longitudinal Development Program that reported that the microbiome at three months of age, but not six or not one year, identified children who developed either a toppy defined by skin testing or had clinical symptoms of wheezing. So it was more important at three months of age than it was at one. And in the study, lower amounts of bacteria like Villanella, Lactobacillus, Rothia, and Fecalobacterium were associated with atopy and wheezing. And in a mouse model, introducing these bacteria improved airway inflammation. And another very similar study, stool profiles at one month, but not six months of age, showed that lower bacterial levels of bifidobacteria, lactobacillus, fecalobacterium, and acromantia, all those things that we see as nice and healthy, and increased fungal levels of things like candida carried a risk of allergies. So it's really important to nail down the microbiome during this early critical development window. Let's go back to those first few exposures to microbes that seed the infant microbiome. Microbial transfer from the mother to the fetus occurs in utero. Microbes have been detected in the placenta, the amniotic fluid, fetal membrane, the umbilical cord blood, and meconium, and studies show that antibiotic use even during pregnancy disrupts the intestinal microbiota of infants. But the first major exposure to microbes really is during the birthing process. The first bacteria to establish in the neonatal gut are mostly aerobic or facultative anaerobic bacteria such as enterobacteria, enterococci, and staphylococci, and they have a very specific job. During their growth, they consume oxygen, and this allows the rise of anaerobic bacteria like bifidobacteria and lactobacillus species, which are very important during this first year of life. This study shows us how similar mom and infant's microbiome is so that this starter culture really comes from mom. 50% of the microbial population in the infant gut belong to species also present in at least one of the sampled maternal body sites. All maternal body sites contributed to the gut microbiome, so 22% from, from mom's stool, 16% from the vagina, 7% from the oral cavity, and 5% from the skin. Species observed in the infant's but not shared with mothers likely came from environmental sources like the other individuals that they were in contact with and the hospital environment. But strains from mom colonized better. So even though they were exposed to these strains from other places, the strains that came from mom tended to stick around longer. Now, a lot of these species that originated from places like the tongue and the skin seem to be transient and aren't suited to colonize the infant lower GI tract. They are easily lost or replaced and seem to contribute to a higher turnover and quickly shifting microbiome during the first few weeks of life. Bifidobacterium longum and Bifidobacterium bifidum from breast milk colonize the gut better, and oral microbes see the infant microbiome more than the adult microbiome. So whenever adults exchange microbes orally, 
They don't tend to stick around in the other person, but when mom and baby exchanges oral, microbiome, oral microbes, they do tend to stick around more. There's a 77 to 95% similarity in the oral cavity between infant and mom. These are the results from a review paper comparing the gut microbiomes of newborns who were vaginally delivered to those who were delivered by C-section. And you can see that the vaginally delivered infants had a higher diversity. And as far as composition, they were higher in these beneficial bacteria like bifidobacteria, bacteroides, and lactobacillus, whereas cesarean delivered infants were higher in some things that we see not as being not as healthy, like staphylococcus, streptococcus, and clostridium. And these things were very similar to the maternal skin and hospital setting. And the rate of C-section should not really exceed 15%, according to the World Health Organization, but 45% of deliveries in the United States are C-section. So theoretically, 30% of C-section deliveries in the United States may have been unnecessary. And we know that there are several reasons why C-sections aren't ideal, but here we see one of those reasons being that it really interferes with the early shaping of the microbiome. This is a study that looked at breastfed versus formula fed microbiomes. And you can see that as far as the breastfed infants, they had lower alpha diversity at 40 days, but we're going to talk about why that might be a good thing. By six months, their diversity was higher than that of formula fed babies. Their beta diversity, so which species were there, was lower. They had less of the less of these uh, diversity in the first three months of life compared to a formula fed infant. And as far as which species were there, again, we see that those things that are seen as not as healthy, like streptococcus and enterococcus, these things were higher in formula-fed infants and lower in breastfed, but good things like bifidobacteria and bacteroides at 40 days were higher in breastfed and lower in formula. And that is kind of me saying bad things and good things is an overgeneralization because we need some of these things. We just don't, we want them to be in balance and not too elevated. So let's talk a little more about breastfeeding versus formula feeding and the microbiome. Early nutrition is a key factor directing the early microbiota composition and function. The microbiome of breastfed infants will be inhabited by specific bacteria who selectively degrade oligosaccharides or the carbohydrate train chain in human milk. Formula fed infants have a more diverse gut microbiome that resembles older children. And while it is true that breastfed infants have less diversity in their microbiome, it tends to be dominated by bifidobacteria, but this is intentional and actually beneficial for baby's health during that early critical development window before solids are introduced. Once solids are introduced, diversity begins to increase in breastfed infants. So here we see the importance of infant type bifidobacteria that comes from breastfeeding. It has an impact on the maturation of the immune system. It helps to colonize anaerobic microbial commensals, educating the host immune system and providing colonization resistance for opportunistic pathogens. They produce vitamins and it helps in remission of atopic dermatitis symptoms in infants, decreases in rotor virus infection, decrease in lactose intolerance, and it provides a diminished risk of allergic diseases, less risk of excessive weight gain, and a better immune response to vaccines. So the bifidobacterium dominant microbiome is laying the foundation during that critical development window before solids are introduced and the next stage of the core microbiome is developed. In a study comparing the microbiome of breastfed and vaginally delivered infants to formula fed and cesarean delivered infants, feeding pattern shaped micro the microbiome in the first six months more than delivery method. I know I've said this a few times. This is a recurring theme here, the importance of the food that we're providing the bacteria. Cesarean and formula 
group contained the most abundant unclassified microbes and the lowest bifidobacteria load. Breastfeeding restored the gut microbiota in cesarean section infants and lowered the risk of respiratory tract infections and diarrhea. So if there was a cesarean section, then breastfeeding helped to make up that ground. In addition to formula and C-section delivery, we're going to touch on a few other factors that create deviation from the development of a healthy core microbiome. And one is PPI use, proton pump inhibitors, which reduce the amount of stomach acid in the stomach. These are things like Prilosec, Nexium, and Prevacid. There was a study that showed that 250 children admitted to the hospital during a two-month period. Of those 250 children, 101 were prescribed PPIs before being admitted to the hospital. 86.2% of children were prescribed PPIs inappropriately based on FDA approved indications. So the risk of PPIs is a reduction in alpha diversity and an increase in pathogens. Stomach acid is very important for killing off some of these pathogens. So if you're stopping the stomach acid, then you're going to have more of the pathogens like C. diff, E. coli, Campylobacteria, Salmonella, Shigella, H. pylori, and a fungal overgrowth. You also have poor digestion and more malabsorption. And there are also GI symptoms like heartburn, feeling full after eating a small amount of food, bloating, gas, constipation, and morning diarrhea. And besides GI symptoms, there's other risks that include fractures in kids, pneumonia, micronutrient deficiencies, and progression of kidney disease. While we are fortunate to have access to antibiotics, I think it's no secret that they tend to be overprescribed, which definitely carries concerning health impacts. One study showed that between 80 and 90 percent of all children will have Otis media with an effusion before school age, so an ear infection. High dose amoxicillin is recommended at, as the first line antibiotic therapy in children with acute Otis media. And 70% of children received at least one antibiotic prescription during the first two years of life. And this alters the gene expression and increases antibiotic resistance. It decreases alpha diversity, increases susceptibility to pathogen colonization, damages the intestinal barrier, and results in metabolic shifts. This image sequences the timeline of conception through late adulthood and the potential impacts of antibiotics on health and overall health in outcomes. And you can see that the red lines indicate that a single dose of antibiotic within the time period has been linked to a health consequence, whereas a dotted red line indicates that multiple doses of antibiotics with the time period are required to observe a link. And I've got some arrows pointing at some important information, those dotted lines. And then we have the age from before birth to 70 years old. And we see the antibiotic use in the first few months of life has been connected to increased risk of infections, asthma, allergy, type one diabetes, loss of diversity, increased risk of childhood obesity. And then later at about a year and a half, increased risk of type two diabetes and an increased risk of infection by C. diff later in life after the age of 18. This table demonstrates the link between the microbiome and internal metabolic function and the influence the bacteria and the balance of certain bacteria have on our risk for certain conditions. In five out of nine studies, antibiotics, including penicillins and macrolides, which are things like azithromycin, which is very common for pneumonia, sinus infections, pharyngitis, and tonsillitis, were associated with reduced bifidobacteria. And amoxicillin exposure was associated with complete disappearance of bifidobacterium adolescence. Four studies showed a decrease in lactobacillus for up to 12 months following exposure to penicillin and up to 24 months following macrolide use. There was a three-fold increase in clostridium within six months of exposure to macrolides and reduced clostridium clusters 4 and 14A, which are healthy clostridium clusters. They're inducers of T-regulatory immune cells and play a role 
and regulating or suppressing other cells in the immune system. And one of our favorite keystone species, Acromantia mucinophilia, completely disappeared with azithromycin use. So I think there's always this mystery around when we give antibiotics, we really don't know what's going to happen as a result. We know that it's not great for the microbiome, but it's kind of a guessing game as to which bacteria, good bacteria, disappear when they come back, if they ever do come back. And these are some great studies that show very common antibiotic usage and what happens to the pediatric microbiome as a result. Another risk of deviation from a healthy microbiome includes a poor diet. So this microbiome-friendly diet gives you an idea of what a microbiome-friendly diet should look like, and any deviation from this is going to be a dysbiosis risk factor. So a good diet for your bacteria includes a lot of fibers with plenty of diversity. I always say diversity in fibers means diversity in bacteria. It's going to be high in polyphenols and antioxidants moderate in protein and fat, low in saturated fat, sugar, and processed foods. And we actually see that a lot of these more harmful bacteria and pathogens really like protein and fat and sugar. They like the standard American diet. So we want some of those things, but we want it to be in moderation. Also, it's important to limit alcohol intake as these can kill off some of the beneficial bacteria to include fermented foods like kimchi and yogurt. It should be organic as much as possible and avoiding emulsifiers to maintain a healthy mucosal barrier as much as possible, and then to be careful with raw foods if you're at risk for pathogens. So Roundup for breakfast. This was an interesting study that talked about pesticide exposure. They tested 28 samples of granola, instant oats, overnight oats, Cheerios, and snack bars. These were Cheerios cereal. These were all Cheerios products. All contain glyphosate levels above the Environmental Working Group's health benchmark of 160 parts per billion. The World Health Organization's internal agency for research on cancer recently concluded that glyphosate is probably carcinogenic in humans. As an endocrine disrupting chemical, glyphosate can alter the functioning of hormonal systems and gene expression patterns. The developing fetus, infant, and children are most at risk, and the action of glyphosate as an antibiotic may alter the gastrointestinal microbiome, which could favor the proliferation of pathogenic microbes in humans. Glyphosate-based herbicides alter the susceptibility of bacteria to six classes of antibiotics and induce multiple antibiotic-resistant phenotypes in potential pathogens like E. coli and salmonella. We did a study that published recently on glyphosate. There was a healthy toddler that was chosen as a donor, and the feces sample was exposed to a concentration of 100 milligrams per liter of glyphosate or Roundup over a three-week period. And during co-treatment, Megaspore was administered at 4 billion CFU for another three weeks. We found that the Roundup formula always resulted in more alteration than glyphosate alone. Overall, most of the metabolites which were altered by Roundup exposure had their levels decreased and were part of many microbial biochemical pathways, such as vitamin or hormone precursors, which suggest that this pesticide mixture exerts global inhibitory effects on the microbial metabolism. Roundup reduced propionate levels, which is an important short-chain fatty acid, but bacillus spore probiotics resulted in recovery of propionate levels, so it brought these levels back up. Alpha diversity decreased with the glyphosate or Roundup formulation, but recovered after exposure to bacillus spores. GABA significantly reduced after Roundup treatment, and ammonia production increased with this pesticide exposure. Another important topic in the pediatric population is vaccination and whether you are for or against it, I think it's important to understand the interaction between the gut microbiome and vaccines. The immune response to vaccines is highly variable between individuals and between populations in different regions of the world. It can be influenced by things like geographical location, host genetics, nutritional status, immunological imprinting through prior exposure and maternal antibodies, 
chronic infections such as TB, HIV, parasites, or hepatitis C, and the gut microbiome status. So having a healthy gut microbiome is very important for vaccines to work effectively. Studies show that vaccines don't work as well when a patient has poor microbiome health or dysbiosis. So if vaccinating, a healthy microbiome is very important. I cringe when I take my kids to the pediatrician and see signs everywhere that say it is safe for your kids to be vaccinated when they are ill. I don't necessarily agree with that statement. Next, reduced adaptive antiviral immunity has been found with the smallpox vaccine when an infant has dysbiosis. And now infants given formula with supplemental probiotics had an enhanced response following vaccination. But this isn't always consistent. There have been a few studies that have reported negative associations between probiotics and vaccine response. And with this, my question really is which probiotics were being used because different microbes influence the immune system differently. And even though they were probiotics, they may not have benefited the situation like we wanted them to. But if the, the correct probiotics were used, then it would have modulated the immune system the way that we wanted it to, hopefully. So what now? What if our patients, our kids, our grandkids encounter one of these events that interrupts the healthy modeling of the microbiome in one of these critical development windows? In the world we live in, it's probably going to happen. However, the world we live in also has some really good tools for helping us get the microbiome back on track. And I hope I can offer a message of hope today, a message to stay calm, assess the situation, and use some of the recommendations from today to start cleaning the mess up. Whatever you do, just don't leave it unattended because we all know what spoiled milk smells like. And we know now that an unattended microbiome doesn't usually bounce back on its own. First, there are really two buckets we want to think about here. The first is correcting who is in the microbiome, bringing that diversity back up, but also thinking about rebuilding the communities of good commensal bacteria and assuring balance. If we have the right bacteria in the gut and we're feeding them, then the only other thing we have to think about is protecting them, which is the second bucket. If you have the correct inputs, you're going to have the correct outputs. If we have the right bacteria and they have optimal nutrition, then they will take care of the rest. They will go to work for us, influencing the immune system, creating short-chain fatty acids, metabolizing hormones, and even fighting off some pathogenic infections. I always say they are our soldiers. So some tips for restoring numbers and balance to who is in the gut would be to focus on a microbiome-friendly diet, to use pre- and probiotic therapy, to decrease inflammation and heal leaky gut, and to have a good healthy exposure to nature. And now how can we protect these good bacteria or our army, if you will, to again use things like probiotics with antibiotics? I think it. we tend to think that we should Think about probiotics after we've been through antibiotics, but the truth is we have some really good probiotics that can withstand antibiotics, and when we take them together, it decreases the damage that the antibiotics do to our overall diversity. Also, we can protect our army by avoiding heavy metal exposure from food and water, by getting optimal sleep and stress reduction, going organic and avoiding pesticides as much as possible, and educating our patients to prevent things like foodborne illness. I've briefly mentioned diet, but I love this functional fibers table. Different fibers feed different bacteria. So we can use this table to almost as a scavenger hunt to try to find different foods in each category to try. You can offer this to your patients, have them try something new. It's two pages long, and there's lots of different categories of fibers, and they're probably missing some of these categories. So if there's specific categories that they're missing, focusing on those categories would be a good place to start. Again, diversity in the diet means diversity in your microbiome. Here's a summary of studies on 13 to 14-year-olds showing changes in the microbiome with increased fibers, including fructans from fruits and vegetables, 
almonds, galacto-oligosaccharides from cow's milk, and soluble corn fiber. We see an increase in microbial diversity just from eating soluble corn fiber for four weeks, and an increase in bacteria like bifidobacteria, lactobacillus, and ruminococcus, which are very healthy, and three to 24 weeks from changing just the diet alone. Also very interesting, we see a stabilization of bifidobacterium during antibiotic treatment in three to six-year-olds consuming six grams a day of inulin-type fructans. Supplemental oligosaccharides that feed bacillus spores, which we're going to talk about next, have shown to increase keystone species, those good, healthy species. It increases fructo -oligosac or fructo oligosaccharides, increase prosnutzi by 100% in just four weeks, and it increases acromantium eosinophilia by 8,000% in five weeks. Galacto oligosaccharides from cow's milk have been shown to increase bifidobacteria by 67% in just as little as one week. And xylo oligosaccharides increase bifidobacteria by 21% in four weeks. Our symbiotic study published in 2019 measured the microbial diversity in short chain fatty acid production following a four week treatment period with five bacillus spores and the oligosaccharides that we just discussed. And it showed an increase in microbial diversity of health promoting keystone species in the gut, including bifidobacteria, lactobacillus, prevotella, and fecalobacterium. It increased total short chain fatty acid production by 80 to 140 percent. And we also saw a significant reduction in pro-inflammatory bacteria like desulfibrio that produce hydrogen sulfide, enterobacteria, and pseudomonas. Now, if you're dealing with picky eaters, then you may be thinking that there's not a lot you can do diet-wise. But the good news is that there has been some research that showed that improving microbiome health improved food preferences, so you can kind of work backwards that way. There are actually quite a few mechanisms by which microbes in our gut influence our food choices, including altering cannabinoid and opioid receptors in the gut, taste receptors being altered by microbes, producing neurotransmitters and toxins and more. So again, if changing the diet isn't much of an option, then we can use some of these other tools like supplements to improve the microbiome. And hopefully the diet will change as the patient becomes a little less dysbiotic. Microbes may manipulate the host eating behavior in ways that promote their fitness at the expense of the host. Lower diversity may be associated with more unhealthy eating behavior because a less diverse microbial population is likely to have species within it, within it that have large population sizes and more resources available for host manipulation. The larger a particular microbial population is, the more power it has to manipulate the host through higher levels of factor production or other strategies and large scale coordination of these activities. For example, through quorum sensing. So another reason that having good diversity is so important. So if you have low diversity, these bacteria that are a little bit more inflammatory and pathogenic can take up a lot of real estate and really gain a lot of ground. They did find that inconsolable crying of infant colic linked was linked with reduced overall diversity, increased proteobacteria, which is a lot more inflammatory, and decreased bacteroides. Crying signals an increased parental attention and feeding, and the colic may increase the resources delivered to the gut and microbial access to the nutrients. So the theory here is, or what they found in the study, is that these microbes were creating more colic because then the, the babies got fed and the bacteria got fed as well. So they're manipulating infant behavior to get what they want. So now let's talk about specific probiotic supplements that can help reestablish the healthy microbiome, intestinal barrier, and immune function of the gut. I'm going to talk about several bacillus spores. And if you're thinking, what about bifidobacteria, especially since we saw the importance of bifidobacteria in early life, 
Well, it can be quite difficult to reseed with probiotics that are bifidobacteria based, although I think specific strains have wonderful prescriptive uses, single strain, single use. But what I love about the bacillus spores is that they help create a healthy ecosystem so other beneficial bacteria like bifidobacterial can thrive. So even though the bacillus spores do not contain bifidobacteria, there's research showing that they increase bifidobacteria species. The first I'm going to talk about is Bacillus clausii. It's a spore that alters pro and anti-inflammatory responses by decreasing expression of TNF-alpha, inhibiting the release of interleukin-8, increasing interleukin-6 and interleukin-10, and more. It has antimicrobial activity by producing human beta defensin 2 It inhibits enterotoxins like those produced by C. diff, and it enhances barrier function. Clausi is known to be polyantibiotic resistant, meaning that its multiple strains each have its own set of resistance to a wide range of antibiotics. So it can be taken with antibiotic therapy. It's able to colonize the intestines even in the presence of antibiotics like neomycin, streptomycin, and tetracycline. This is a study on clausi and diarrhea in, the, in pediatric patients, and the aim of the study was to assess the safety and effectiveness of bacillus clausi as an adjunct to standard therapy in Filipino children with acute community-acquired diarrhea of viral origin and associated with antibiotic administration. There were over 3,000 patients that were about two years old in this study, and they were treated with bacillus clausi for five to seven days. The results showed that the tolerability was excellent, and more than half of the study group, the diarrhea was resolved within the first three days of treatment with clausi. It significantly reduced the mean number of stools per day from five to a little over one, and the proportion of patients with loose stools decreased from 81% at baseline to 9% at the end of the treatment period. And additional studies with rotavirus infection, respiratory tract infection, and allergic rhinitis shows that two to four billion CFU of clausi per day had a decrease in symptoms like weakness, abdominal pain, fever, diarrhea, vomiting. It also helped to normalize secretory IgA and decrease pro-inflammatory cytokines. Another bacillus spore with specific benefits in the pediatric population is bacillus coagulans, which produces bacteroidins, which create an environment non-conductive for the growth of pathogenic bacteria. It improves immune stimulation and gut defense through L-lactic acid production. It improves the digestibility of lactose and those with lactose intolerance. I think that is a very important point to make since a lot of kids have lactose intolerance. It increases protein digestion and uptake in the upper GI tract, reducing the amount of protein delivered to the colon, and studies in antibiotic-associated diarrhea, IBS, functional bowel disorders, and flatulence show that it has benefits. Bacillus coagulans increases the number of beneficial species, including prosnutsi. It reduces the frequency of GI symptoms such as bloating, cramping, abdominal pain, diarrhea, and constipation in adults and children with IBS. It lowers fecal pH, produces short-chain fatty acids, and improves functional constipation, and it has been shown to inhibit the growth of staphylococcus and enterococcus. The third bacillus strain is Bacillus subtilis. I always say this is our favorite bacillus strain. It's in all the products that we have that have bacillus spores. It naturally produces 12 plus antibiotics and it, studies show that it inhibits H. pylori, enterococcus, campylobacteria, jejuni, and shigella. Supplementation with 2 billion CFUs of bacillus HU58 reduces interleukin-6 by 45% and TNF-alpha by 55%. So it's great for the immune system. It produces vitamin K2, and it's a strong producer of short-chain fatty acids. Overall, it is beneficial for extra immune support, dysbiosis and pathogens, and reduction of antibiotic-associated diarrhea. The last bacillus spore I will talk about is Indicus. It produces carotenoids that are easily absorbed in the GI tract 
and it has superior antioxidant activity compared to lycopene and four and a half times higher bioavailability than beta carotene. And another probiotic that I really like for the pediatric population is Saccharomyces boulardii. It's been used commercially for over 30 years. It's resistant to gastric acidity and it's naturally resistant to antibiotics, so very similar to the bacillus spores. This is a survivability data from our supplier of our Saccharomyces boulardii strain, showing that it survives in the stomach and in the duodenum, which is very acidic. Saccharomyces has many benefits, including antibiotic-associated diarrhea, occasional diarrhea and traveler's diarrhea, H. pylori, C. diff, infant and pediatric gut health, IBS. It also competes with candida. And for that reason, I like it in the uh, pediatric population a lot because a lot of kids, unfortunately, eat a lot of sugar. They have more candida overgrowth. We sometimes see more C. diff when we're doing stool testing. So it seems to be gentle and well-tolerated in the pediatric population. And a lot of times I will start there with children. In a 2007 study on immune system enhancement in children with acute gastroenteritis, 27 children aged six months to 10 years with acute diarrhea were given Saccharomyces boulardii. It was administered twice daily at 250 milligrams, or they were given a placebo for seven days. After seven days, compared to baseline, Saccharomyces boulardii had a significant increase of IgA levels, a decrease of C-reactive protein levels, an increase of CD8 lymphocyte levels, and there was a significantly higher increase in the probiotic group than the placebo group on day seven. It reduced the duration of diarrhea compared to the placebo group. So in summary, the ideal microbiome is resilient and productive. The pediatric microbiome helps to shape the immune system, the nervous system, and growth. The first two years of life are a critical development window for establishing the microbiome. Healthy microbiome development can be intersected by dysbiosis risk factors, such as maternal dysbiosis, poor diet, medications, pesticide exposure, infections, stress, and delivery by C-section. An intentional intervention can restore the microbiome and protect from future assaults. And functional fibers and bacillus spore probiotics influence the immune system, boost beneficial species, enhance barrier function, and can be taken alongside antibiotic therapy when needed. And the last thing I want to do is put a little plug in for our new product that will be launching exclusively on Full Scripts on Monday. And this is Zen Biome Dual. It's a product that we're really excited about. It's a dual strain probiotic for digestive discomfort and mood self-regulation. You can think about the gut-brain axis and IBS, conditions that present with both GI symptoms and anxiety, stress, depression. It contains B Bifidobacterium longum 35642, which is a strain that has been researched for many years, and it has the best evidence of efficacy in IBS and helping with digestive symptoms. And the other strain in Zimbiome Dual is Bifidobacterium longum 1714, which we have been using in our Zimbiome Sleep and Cope products, and it has been shown to improve stress responses and cognitive function. And here are the references, and that's it. Thank you so much, Star. Oh my goodness. So much information and in-depth information in such a short amount of time. <laughs> yes, I'm shocked I got done that early. <laughs> I was actually taking slides out. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. I know so much to go over in such a short amount of time and we really appreciate having you here and doing this incredible presentation. Um, okay, so I'm going to get right to it. We're going to start with the Q&A session. If anybody has anything that comes up while we're chatting, just add it in here, and um, I'll be able to get those questions answered and follow up at a later date if necessary. So keep them coming in. Uh, let's see. So um, let me just start with a question from Rebecca here. It says, would you recommend Restoflora or Megaspore Biotics for a child on antibiotics? And there's a second question part of that. Um, would one be better for a child or are both about the same in benefit? 
you can't go wrong either way, so don't stress about the choice. I tend to prefer Restora Flora when a child is on antibiotics because of that Saccharomyces boulardii helps with diarrhea. We have all that research showing that, but there's also some spores from Megaspore in the Restora Flora. Excellent. Excellent. So I've got a little bit of a, a paragraph here from George, but I just want to start start with that as well. So George asks, when a child is born to a mom with post-infectious gastroplasty resulting in gluten and dairy sensitivity, and that child developed the sensitivities, how do you reverse the child's immune response to gluten and dairy? Specifically, what steps would you take? And specifically, how would you reverse this if possible? Yeah, I, I can't promise that it could it would be reversed, but I do think that when we improve the microbiome, a lot of these sensitivities do get better. So it's definitely possible. I would probably start, depending on the age of the child, with a little bit of HU58. As they get older, you can add in some things like the Mega IgG2000. We would want to increase fibers and use things like Mega Pre to improve diversity. So you want to work on getting that inflammatory load down. The HU58 is going to help with the immune response as well. Excellent. Okay, the next question that we have is, can you expand on the statement that intense exercise is harmful to the microbiome? Yeah, so intense exercise is stressful to the body and it is stressful to the microbiome. So it can be harmful to the, the diversity, but mostly the inflammation in the gut and it can lend to leaky gut. So that is something that you, know, you, may, you may know about runner's diarrhea. Um, people who do a lot of strenuous, especially endurance exercise, they do develop leaky gut over time. Excellent. Kelly asks, if the mother's microbiome is not healthy, is breastfeeding still beneficial? Yes. Breastfeeding is going to help protect the baby and provide them with some immunoglobulins and things that will be more beneficial to them than formula, even if mom's um, microbiome is unhealthy. Excellent. Pam asks, what's your opinion on the new pediatric guidelines that recommend that recommend starting high um, allergenic foods as early as four months of age and continuing exposure at least two to three times a week for ever after? I see where they're coming from with that, because I do think there's some research that shows that waiting until later actually increases the chance of an allergic reaction. I do think it's important in families that are prone to have these allergies that you be very careful with it. Introduce one thing at a time, maybe wait on a little bit older, but to just be careful and watch and do it in a controlled environment. But I do think that there's some validity to that. Excellent. Melvin asks, um, can you explain the difference between beta and alpha diversity? Sure. So beta diversity is a quantity measure, whereas, or, sorry, alpha diversity is quantity, beta is quality. So with alpha diversity, we're looking at the total number of species. It doesn't matter who they are. In general, having greater alpha diversity means that you have a stronger and more resilient microbiome. But beta diversity doesn't really take into effect how many species we're looking at who is there. Are the bacteria in the gut similar to what we find in the healthy human gut? So it's how many are there versus who is there. Excellent. And Melvin also asks, any suggested good formula milk? It's been a while since I've been around the formula world. I don't even, I'm imagining that it's probably changed a lot, probably 10 years. So in the last 10 years, there's probably been a lot of changes with formula and I haven't dealt with formulas a lot lately. So I'm not sure I can answer that question right now. Thank you for your honesty. <laughs> that was perfect. Um, Felicia asks, is there any consequences to starting uh, prebiotics young? Um, I would say you want to be careful with what you introduce. We do sometimes recommend maybe something like HU58, just as you can open the capsule up, put a few granules on your fingertips. So it's just a few granules at when they're very, very young, few weeks, few months old, and it's okay. But sometimes we don't know what these probiotics are doing. We may think that it's a probiotic, so just throw it in there. But I would be careful about what you're adding. 
I don't think that you can do it too early, depending on the situation. If someone was, if it was a cesarean delivery and they were formula fed, then it'd be more beneficial. Excellent. So what we'll do, if it's okay with you, Stars, we'll just go five minutes over. So I'll just keep going through the questions here. And anyone that needs to drop, totally understand. We'll send the recording via email. Um, so you have all the, the uh, answers here. So just keeping going here. Um, Pam asks, how do you advise parents to help their kids who have rigid diet or are picky eaters? For example, kids on the spectrum of autism. Yeah, I totally get that. I've got some very picky eaters myself. And fortunately, as they get older, it tends to get a little bit better or it has in our case just continual exposure without forcing. I think it's important not to encourage a child too much. They need to be around the food. They need to see it there and maybe one day they'll pick it up. When they get into school, I've found that being around other kids has a lot more influence on what they're eating than what I have had. So sometimes when they see their kids, their friends eating lettuce, they're more encouraged to eat lettuce. Um, other than that, you know, I do think there's some interesting facts about using supplements to correct the microbiome, like we talked about being the, the puppet masters. When mm -hmm. we correct the microbiome through supplements and ther therapies like that, their taste preferences may actually change. So if you can't do a lot about the food, then it's very easy to add some of these supplements to the diet. A lot of them are powders if the kids don't take capsules that can be mixed in foods, cooked in foods, some of them. So it's easy to get those things in. And hopefully when we start to correct the microbiome, then they will start to prefer other foods. Excellent. Pauline asks, do you have any insight on how anesthesia affects the microbiome? That's a good question. I do not. I do know that it has create it creates some motility issues. And when we have motility issues, then we start to get dysbiosis. But I do not specifically know. It would be do, easy to do a search for that in PubMed, look for anesthesia and the microbiome, and it may pull up some studies. Excellent. Julie asks, in regards to supplements, after a gut is restored and balanced, what do you recommend for a maintenance um, gut health regimen? That's a great question. I think it is important to stay on a maintenance dose because we're going to be continually exposed to these dysbiosis risk factors, no matter how careful we are. So a good maintenance dose would be if you're using the spores to use them one or once or twice a week, they do stay around for about 21 to 28 days. So if you're taking them once or twice a week, you're still going to have a good level there. And they don't actually die after that 21 to 28 days. They're just transient. So they go back into their spore form. They are intended to go back into the environment and stay there for their next host to pick up. Um, and then you can do maintenance dose of mega pre. And if you're using mega mucosa, you can do a maintenance dose of those two about once a week should be good. Excellent. Excellent. Kelly asks, do you recommend these fibers when someone has SIBO? That's a great question as well. It depends on the extent of it. If someone has a severe enough case that they are going through antimicrobials, we'll generally recommend waiting for the something like the mega pre until after they've been through their antimicrobial phase because they may not be tolerated very well if they have that much overgrowth. We do find that the, the mega pre tends to be tolerated really well, but in some cases it might cause more symptoms. So I would only wait if it's causing more symptoms. Excellent. Melvin asks, should we rotate probiotics? Another great question. So that it all depends. I think the premise for that comes from these formulas that have a lot of different things in them and they don't necessarily reseed. It doesn't mean they're not beneficial. Sometimes these things can have benefits even though they're dead. We call them ghost probiotics as they're moving through. Mm -hmm. But once you stop taking them, they're not going to be doing anything because they're not there anymore. So sometimes rotating those type of probiotics can be beneficial. But when you use spores, it doesn't really work that way because they're more of a foundational probiotic and their job is to go in and fix the environment. 
So they use quorum sensing to interact with the other microbes. They produce nutrients. They produce an environment in which these other beneficial bacteria can reseed and can grow. So with the spores, they don't need to, they're not going to ever stop working. They're always going to be working as long as they're there. And then if you need to take some of these more prescriptive things on top of them, I think that's a good idea. Excellent. Um, Deborah asks, what is the favorite probiotic for pregnancy? Hmm, probably Megaspore has been used the most for pregnancy, but HU58, Restore Flora, they would be great as well. Excellent. And Jamie asks, um, what probiotics do you recommend for breastfeeding infants who are gassy? HU58 is where I would start. And again, just a few granules. It doesn't take much. And the capsules, you can open them up, sprinkle a little powder, and then you can close them up. They don't need to be refrigerated. They're really hardy. So a capsule will last you a while. But that's what I would usually start with in an infant who is a little bit more on the colicky side. Excellent. And I'm not sure if it would be different or if it's close to the last question that we uh, answered, but is there a type of probiotic you prefer for nursing mothers? For the mom, Megaspore, HU58 would be great. I would probably start off with Megaspore as just a good general probiotic for a nursing mom. Excellent. And uh, Melvin asks, is uh, secretory IgA good to see in the stool result? It's good at a healthy level, but if it's elevated, of course, that means that the immune system is upregulated and trying to fight something off. So we don't want it to be high. Okay. Excellent. Uh, we're getting lots of thank yous and lots of uh, lots of heartfelt thank yous coming in here. And um, could you just remind us the name of the new product? Yes, Zen Biome Dual. Excellent. And look forward to communications about that starting next Monday on April 3rd. Um, and that unfortunately is all the time that we have. I just want to say thank you so much to everybody who attended today. It really means the most to both Star and myself. And thank you so much, Star, for this great engaging presentation. Everyone look out in their email for a link to this recording. And if anyone has any additional questions, they can send them uh, right to me at my email address. That's Amy, A-M-Y dot regan r-e-g-a-n at fullscript.com excellent we have any anything to kind of wrap us up star as we sort of leave yeah i just want to say that we're all aware of these dysbiosis risk factors that can create a lot of anxiety in us but we don't live in a perfect world and things are going to happen so just remember there is hope we have tools to overcome these assaults and encourage your caregivers to be intentional about rebuilding and protecting the microbiome. Of course, diet's very important. Getting in nature is very important, but also testing the microbiome to learn about the damage, which isn't something we talked a lot about today because of time. But we do have these specific supplements that can attend to the ecosystem and they really can help. So be sure to reach out to us. We've got many more products that are great for everything I talked about today. I just didn't have time to talk about all of them. Excellent. Thank you so much, Star, and everyone enjoy their afternoon. Thank you.